Hi, today I'm going to look at Wireshark dump cap. Now there are often times when we want to capture packets for long periods of time, maybe uh, hours, days or even weeks. And that's quite difficult to do with Wireshark or with the command line version of Wireshark, T-Shark. But the Wireshark suite provides this additional piece of software called dump cap. And I'm going to explain how we can use that for long term capturing. So we're going to look at how DumpCap works and I'll briefly show you the command line first just to give you a feel for how this uh, hangs together. Then we're going to look at why you use it and when you should use it. We're going to look at a long term capture configuration. And then finally we'll look at why use DumpCap rather than T-Shark. So I've mentioned that it's a command line program. So here's a typical command line to invoke dump cap. The minus I4 is the index into the correct interface, and I'll show you how to list the indexes later. Minus Q is running dump cap in quiet mode, and that primarily suppresses it from outputting a, a packet count. Then we have minus B file size 200,000. This refers to the size of the file that DumpCap will produce. So in this case, it will produce a 200 megabyte file. Then we can specify a number of files and this forms a ring buffer. So in this case, I've specified 5,000 files, each of them of 200 megabytes. And so that gives us a total capture capacity of one terabyte. Of course, we have to have one terabyte of disk space to operate it, but um, that's what you can do with those two parameters. Then we have minus capital B 1024. This refers to the size of the kernel buffer. Um, we'll see later that dump cap temporarily places incoming packets in a buffer in the kernel, and uh, this helps us ride out spikes in the traffic, which I'll, I'll explain a little later. And then finally we have the minus W switch and the specification for a file path. Now that looks like a, the definition for a single file, but we'll see later that actually DumpCap suffixes the file name with a file number and a date and time. So we'll see that later on. Here's how DumpCap works under Windows. What I tell you here is mostly going to be true for Mac and for Linux. There are some detailed differences, but the principles remain the same. So what happens is the packet comes in off the wire um, through the NIC driver, and then we have this software driver called npf.sys. Now this is part of the WinPCAP software suite. When you install Wireshark, you may remember that you're prompted to say whether or not to install WinPCAP and npf.sys is a core part of WinPCAP. The packet is then placed in the kernel buffer and then we have a user land process, so a program, the dump cap program, which actually pulls the packets out of the buffer through these uh, using these two DLLs, wpcap and packet.dll. And then finally, DumpCap writes the packet to a PCAP file. And so that's the flow of the packets through the software. Just like uh, uh, Wireshark, and in fact Wireshark uses DumpCap for its, its capture mechanism. And of course uh, we know that Wireshark supports BPF capture filtering. And so DumpCap obviously has to do the same because that's the underlying mechanism. And we also saw in the command line that you can adjust the kernel buffer. Um, you can adjust the size of it. Uh, in a 64-bit machine, we typically use one gig. In um, a 32-bit machine, you would use significantly less. But I'll, I'll mention, talk about this a bit more later. So I mentioned the possibility of having a ring buffer. Now, what a ring buffer means is that 
We start by creating files one after the other, and then once we've used up the full 5,000 files, we simply wrap around and start overwriting earlier files. And so you can see from this animation that we just have this continuous rolling capture. For a 64-bit Windows machine, we recommend that you capture in file sizes of 200 megabytes, no, no more than that. In 32-bit machines, you'll want to use 50 megabytes or 100 megabytes. Now, it doesn't actually affect the capture, but when you come to load the file into Wireshark, you'll find that if you try to load a 400 megabyte file, say, into a 32-bit Windows machine, it takes a very long time to load, and then any um, filter activity, anytime you use a filter or you reorder packets or you change columns, it takes a very long time to do any of those operations. So we've found that 50 to 100 megabytes is workable with 32-bit and 200 megabytes and perhaps a bit more is workable with 64-bit windows. Now if we have a ring buffer of say 5,000 files, if these files are all 200 megabytes, then obviously that gives us a total capture capacity of one terabyte. Now at one gigabit per second for duplex, if you have 50% load on a link that's running one gigabit full duplex, you will produce 450 gigabytes per hour. And therefore, this ring buffer can accommodate about two hours of traffic. Now as it um, flips between the files, the um, kernel buffer will store up packets and, and buffer any impacts that you might have. So you don't get a great deal of packet loss even though you're changing to be between the files unless you start to run at very high data rates and then you will find you'll lose a few packets as um, the one file is closed and the next file is opened. So this is how we would set up dump cap or in any one of these um, possibilities. You can run dump cap on a user's PC. You can run dump cap on a server. Um, the impact on the server, the processor impact is minimal. You probably wouldn't even be able to measure it. The memory impact, obviously, if you're going to specify a one gigabyte kernel buffer, then there is an impact there and you may want to consider the size of buffer to use. But the biggest impact is file I.O. And so what you must make sure is that you don't output the dump cap file to any important disks. So certainly don't output it to the C drive in Windows or, or the system disk in, in other operating systems. We often use USB attached disks and they work very well. Um, but just make sure that you send it somewhere to a quiet disk that's not going to cause performance issues. The alternative, of course, is to run a standalone uh, packet capture unit with dump caps. So this could be just a standalone Windows machine. We use uh, One U servers um, for this purpose. It doesn't, a good brand is, is good. We use Dell R320s to give you some sort of idea of the spec. Um, I think we're using R320s and R34, uh, R420s at the moment. And then, obviously, if you're running it in a standalone mode uh, with that standalone analyzer, you have to set up a monitor port or a mirror port on your Ethernet switch, or you'll have to use a tap, or you'll have to use some other way of getting the packets into that analyzer. And you can find more details about those techniques on Tribe Lab. There's a whole section on packet capture. So let's actually use dump cap and see what we can do with it. So the first thing I said I'd do is show you how to get a listing of the interfaces and their index numbers. Now it's quite simple. We type in dump cap minus D. Oh, by the way, I have the Wireshark directory on my system path. That's why I'm just able to type in the command. So just bear that in mind. You'll need to have it on, on your path to be able to use it directly like this. Otherwise, you'll have to uh, prefix the dump cap with the full path information. 
So there we go. You can see that I have five network interfaces um, and the one I'm particularly interested in is interface number three. So what we do is we type in dump cap minus I three. Um, I'm not going to run it in quiet mode actually this time. We'll, we'll skip that so you can see the packets ticking over. Then we specify minus B and a file size. I'm going to specify quite a small file size for the time being. I'll, I'll just set it to a thousand kilobytes, which is one megabyte. And then we specify minus B files. So we have a ring buffer and I'll just specify a ring buffer of four files. And then I'm going to output the information like that. Okay, so let's hope that I've got the command right. And we're now capturing packets. So let's um, just uh, start something so that we can generate some traffic. Go back to our capture. And you can now see we're, we're clocking over the packets. Um, let's go to the directory. And you can see that we're already onto the second file by the looks of things. So we've created the first file. Let's look at. Uh, so we've created the first file of, of around a megabyte. We've created a second file. We're now onto the third file. And as it keeps clicking over more and more, um, obviously it's writing into that file, then it will close that one off. Now you note here that the where I said my trace pcap ng, we've got a suffix on the file name of the a file number and then uh, date and time so it's in ISO format so you can see it's year 2015 month 08 date 28th and it's 073656 in the morning so this is the showing you the time that the capture was started the modified date will be the time the capture ended but anyway, you can see that we're clicking over some files. Now what we should see next is because we've now written this is the fourth file, what we'll see is that file number one will be deleted um, and we'll overwrite it with file number five. Let's just go back and check that our capture is still running. You can see it is. I seem to not be generating as many packets as I'd hoped. And there you see that we have file number five and file number one has now disappeared. So this gives you some idea also of the time span that we're covering here. You can see that we started at 3708 and we're now at 3852. So with uh, four files of one, uh, one megabyte each, you can see that we're covering almost two seconds, uh, two, almost two minutes. So that's, uh, that shows you how that works and it's no more complicated than that. There are some more instructions on the TribeLab site telling you about the practicalities of running uh, dump cap and some reminders around the kernel buffer sizes and file sizes. Now the problem with T-Shark is that like Wireshark, as T-Shark is capturing packets, it's building quite large memory structures because it decodes the packets as it detects them, as it, as it reads them off the wire. And so that means that as it's running, T-Shark is using more and more memory. But if you compare that to DumpCap, DumpCap doesn't decode the protocols as it captures, and so the DumpCap process memory remains pretty steady. And that means that you can run it for very long periods without problems. And we've run dump cap continuously for literally months and um, it still kept going. So in summary, dump cap comes as part of the Wireshark shark suite. So you don't have to download anything additional. And as I did mention, dump cap is actually the underpinning capture mechanism under Wireshark. When you start a capture in Wireshark, what you actually do is start dump cap. 
You can start it yourself from the command line. and We've seen how we do that. It's better for long-term captures because T-Shark will gradually use more and more memory and eventually you'll run out of virtual memory. Uh, we can use a ring buffer to give us long-term capture capability. Something I haven't talked about, you can put the command, the dump cap command, in a, bat, a .bat file or a, or a Unix or Mac script file. And in that way, you can consistently keep restarting dump cap with the correct parameters. And that's quite attractive if you're having to do this in um, an enterprise environment where maybe uh, your capture gets stopped because of uh, change uh, management window and then you need someone to restart it. Rather than having to teach them all about dump cap, you can simply get them to run the uh, script or the .bat file. There, is, there are manual pages for dump cap and they contain all the information about all the parameters available on dump cap. And then we have a guide on TribeLab in the uh, section Network Trace Capture Guide. So I hope you found that useful and I'll see you next time.